So there's not too many people yet. Start at 505, or what's the mode? It's on the wall. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Um, is there are not too many people yet? Uh, let's start at 505, or? Yeah, I would good? wait for a second. Yeah. Hey, Philip. Hello.
So I removed my screen share. You can start, Sandro. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. If not, just tell me. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone to our second round of the Lectures at Home event series from the Microsoft Campus community. My name is Sandro. I'm lead of the Baden Württemberg area and host of this event today. And I'm happy to introduce Dominic to you. He had several events together with us in the past, and I'm happy to have him here again. Dominic is head of DevOps at Moshes, and I guess he will tell something more about him as soon as he started. So just before we start, you should have the chat this time. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in chat or raise your hand, and we are happy to answer them. OK, I will give the microphone to Dominic now. Thank you, Sandro, for the introduction. Um, so then uh, let's start. Um, so just two brief sentences about um, where we're coming from. So um, we're both, like Lucas and me, are working for Motius. So we are R&D company. Um, we are working on the newest technology. And in this case, I mean, Kubernetes is not the newest technology, but it's still quite new, I'd say. Um, so we help, so as a DevOps team, we help all our teams in all of those different fields of expertise to deploy all their backend services. And that's where me and Lucas come in. So I'm basically um, head of DevOps, as you already said. So I'll evaluate technologies um, if we want to use them or if they're uh, appropriate for our use cases. And then Lucas is helping me and can say two sentences about himself again. He wants to? Yeah. So as you might know me, I presented the introduction to Kubernetes. And I helped Dominic uh, with the DevOps team and uh, most of the teams here at Monchos to develop their products. So now we've done all the introduction. Um, and let's come to our agenda. What will we do today? So it's focused around. Uh, so the talk's called like um, Docker file to uh, Kubernetes. So we're going to do a short introduction, just a recap about um, like Docker and Docker Compose and all of those essentials we will need later. Um, then we're going to have a look at Compose. Then I also hope to squeeze and customize. And then in the end, we're just going to do a super brief helm because uh, I guess going in there will be um, too much for today. And then I'm going to do a summary together with you and a Q&A in the end. OK, so let's start with a round of introduction slides. Um, this is also the time when you can follow this QR code. This leads to um, GitHub, where we have um, open source one of our internal blueprints for a Django application that we're going to show you and um, deploy to Kubernetes today. Um, so follow this link and download the repository if you want to follow on. This will contain all the manifests that we will have a look at later. You can also do this after the talk if you want to. So short introductions um, about Dockerfile and Docker Compose. Then afterwards, uh, structure of that real quick, and then how you actually do it locally. And then from there on out, we're going to head to um, deploying it into Kubernetes. So this is the Docker file, or I'm not sure, it should be the recent Docker file in there. So um, this is how it will look like. This is a multi-stage build, as you can see. So we have two stages. Um, one stage builds kind of like the binaries, so to speak, and the other um, takes those binaries in. And then um, we have the different statements that you can see, um, just if you're curious. So we have the froms. Um, the, the work deers where we change to a directory, then the run commands where we execute um, things. For example, let's say uh, we want to do the pip wheel, for example, where we do a pip install or pip wheels. 
Um, and then down there, we do a pip install, for example. Then we have the copy and adds where we take external files and put them inside of the container. And then as well, we have um, the user directive and the expose directive. Those two directives, um, so especially the expose directive actually is just metadata as far as I'm aware of, and the user um, specifies which user to run this application as if you're running it locally. And then followed up by the two entry point and command directives. Those two um, is basically if you have entry point and command executed, it will like concatenate those two commands. So it will be entry point plus command. If you only have, for example, the entry point or command, it will of course also concatenate. Um, if you only want to specify one, usually you do the command. Good. So short recap about a Docker file. Hope everybody is kind of familiar with it already. That's why I went over it really quickly. Good. Let's come to the Docker Compose setup. So what we will have for this, um, this whole thing is going to be an application, which is the Django application, and a database, which is going to be Postgres. So um, we'll have two services. That's what they're called in, in Docker Compose. Um, we have the, two, uh, the context if we want to build a local image. So um, we specify where the, the Docker file resides because our Docker file doesn't reside in the base directory. That's what this does. Um, and we're going to give it a name. This will, be come, this will come in handy later if we want to deploy it actually to um, Kubernetes. Exactly. Good. Um, and then we will have the ports. Basically, this will this is also useful later on because the ports tells you which service is exposed. To. Like, for example, the app here has ports, and then 8,000 8, to 8,000, which means 8,000 of outside, like on your local machine, will map to 8,000 of inside of your container. And those and those port definitions will then later be um, evaluated. Okay. Then short, really brief about the application, which is not too important for you, um, like to understand it completely, but if you want to later on um, like extend it, um, this will be come in handy. So we have basically the apps folder, locale, template, and tests. This comes from Django, from our sample application, which basically just is, um, it offers users and login. Um, and Swagger. So this is what it offers. This uh, files you can find there. Um, we will just take them and package them into the container. Then we have containers. What we usually do if one application has a subset of multiple con different containers that needs to be built, we'll stack them here. So for example, we have an app. If we want to have, I don't know, a custom Redis or something like that, we would like add different subdirectories here. Um, Helm file D actually is not in, uh, like I removed it from, from, the, um, from the one on GitHub, but this is if you want to have Helm file in the base directory. Um, we use that for our GitLab CI, um, but we'll today have a look at different options. So that's why I grouped this into a folder called K8S. And in, in there you will find um, all the different modules for Helm, Customize, um, Compose, and also Helm file folder. So logically grouped there. And then we have this Manage Compose Pi, um, which is a wrapper that uh, Philip wrote to actually easier use um, Pi, uh, the Django application, which is running inside of the Docker Compose. Okay. And this is where we'll quickly jump into the console. I'll just need to find one. There it is. Um, so this is just the Git repository. And then actually, so
this should hopefully work. Let's say I tested everything else, but not the local deployment. And then there we have our API running, including the Swagger documentation and the admin page where you can log in if you're curious with admin app, or you should be able to log in with admin admin. And this application that is running on my local host now, inside of those two Docker containers, we want to take that and we want to ship it to Kubernetes now. So we have a working local um, deployment and let's go to Kubernetes. So as I already told you, there's different ways to do it. The first, the first one we're going to have a look at is Compose, because Compose basically takes a Docker Compose file and converts this definition into the manifest that you've seen from Lucas last time. So it will map, and as they um, actually call themselves, their conversion tool for Docker Compose to container orchestrators such as Kubernetes or OpenShift. So just conversion if you have it already. Then um, it maps volumes to PVCs. Um, you can specify that. So there's a lot of labels that you can use to specify. The default will be a PVC. So I highlighted what the default is. Then um, if you do expose and ports, those will be mapped to services so that you can actually reach them. Um, services themselves, because like the, the definition is different. Like a service is like we have the services app and database in the Docker Compose, but the service and SVC on Kubernetes is something different. So don't get confused here. So the service will be mapped into a deployment. So we will have in the end two deployments um, for both um, the database as well as the application. And then service type will be cluster IP so um, that you can reach it internally. Like Lucas already told you, node port, for example, would be that you can reach it externally just using the IP address of um, the node concatenated with this randomly assigned node port. Okay. You can configure those using labels. So you can change um, everything that has, like for example, volumes, you can change that. Um, you can also change the volume size because like the Docker Compose locally doesn't have a definition of how big is actually the, um, how big, actually the volume is and you need that for kubernetes to like actually use it unless you use a host path or an mtdr and then um, you also can specify if it's a deployment replica set or a daemons replica controller or a daemon set and also if you want to do an ingress we'll do that later um, when i've showed you what it doesn't do or what, what problems i faced so all the nice things you you would think it's it's all super good. Um, it all like usually you already have a Docker Compose, so why not use it? So in some of those cases are if you want an init container. So for example, in this case, an init container could be we have a Django app that connects to a database and needs to initialize the database. Um, that you would split out of the running container and do it in an init container because it's supposed to be run before the actual application. That is not possible or I didn't find it. Um, then multiple different types of volumes. What do I mean by that? If I, for example, want to share vol um, files between two containers inside of a pod, I could use an empty directory, an empty deer, um, for something that is like uh, ephemeral. So let's say the static files will be collected but they can be thrown away and recreated every time I start the application. But the media folder 
for example, this is the file uploads, this needs to be persisted to disk. So I can either choose to persist like static and media both at the same time, or I can make them both ephemeral, but I cannot change them. Like there is no way to do it differently. Then the next one is my favorite thing uh, when, I, when I started to try it. Um, as you saw in the example that I showed you earlier, we use a file called .env for like the development configuration. And we're also using um, environment variables, but compose convert, this is actually the command that com converts a compose file. This guy doesn't take environment variables. So you would have to specify every everything like manually in the compose uh, in the compose file, and you are not able to change it dynamically using um, environment variables. Why would you use that in CI? You will do that all the time. So there's uh, this snippet. You will also find it later in the um, in the compose Docker compose file that I will just copy it out of. Um, it's like three com uh, commands concatenated um, to actually do it. Then something like extra host is not defined. If you, for example, have um, a host name that is not resolved by a DNS, but you have hard coded in an ECT host, for example, and you need that, this is not really possible or I didn't find it. And security context is kind of like partially implemented, not all of it. Like FS group, I think, was not implemented. So if you don't, basically don't know what security context is. I will not go into detail about this. It just defines, um, for example, which user runs the application. So I will upload this documentation afterwards also to GitHub. If you're interested, there will be always links to um, the documentation, the official ones, um, some useful links that I find useful. And for Compose, I have a list of GitHub issues um, of stuff that is not working. So let's jump into Compose. This is where my beautiful shell image comes into play. Um, there we go. OK, so we have Minikube. So Minikube is running, as you've seen it here. So we have Minikube running. Um, if you don't have Minikube running, it should be up. And we will start with um, just start an editor in here real quick. And we will start with compose. So I have this compose file, and this is the amazing string that I was talking about, this uh, concatenation of three um, yeah, commands. Um, and there's this end file that needs to like, okay, I can actually show you what happens if you don't do it. So. And we get all of those files out. And you see there's a DB host, for example, and the deployment in here should now have an environment variable, oh, wrong deployment, uh, app deployment should have an environment variable with the field set. Where is it? But actually didn't even pick it up. It only has site URL set. Yeah, because that's static. So it doesn't evaluate those. If you would do a no normal Docker compose, you do Docker compose config. And then what you get out is like the filled in values. And with this, you can then pipe this into the convert, which will put it in, into STD out, which will then go into the cube control apply. Sorry, it's the way it has to be. And I just need to quickly check if I'm on Minikube. Yes, then I'll just switch to the correct namespace. Yeah, okay. Um, and then we will do compose config this 
And as I told you, I tested before, so everything is actually was there. Um, so we will need to do a Docker Compose build now. So as I've referenced it over here, we're using an image um, on localhost 5000. This is the built-in Docker registry in Minikube. So if you go here, I've prepared um, two extra views. So this port forwards me, this is also documented, this port forwards me um, the registry which is inside of um, the Minikube to localhost 5000 so that I can do Docker Compose push to not get my image in. Uh, wow, um, sorry. Connection refused. Good thing that I've tested it before. Let's restart and see. Okay. Sure. Sorry guys for the inconvenience. Um, I've tested before and of course it worked and uh, it doesn't anymore. We need to get this image in. Port forward and error cut forward, error forward port to pod, exit status, connection refused. I, think I mean, I can also do the pod directly. The name of the controller and um, it's called registry yeah. so I'm doing I mean this command worked before but I can also directly do to the pod so let's let's try that if that works better. This guy, I hope. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, the other one worked before. Um, I will investigate why it doesn't work, and I will um, put this in into the README as well. Um, so we needed to get this image in because otherwise it will not work because it's referenced in there. Okay, so let's go to the magical three pieces of doom. Cool. And back here. I will show you in the UI. I just like the UI better. But uh, if you if you want, I can also show it to you in the CL, uh, CLI. Uh, we're at Compose. So we have those two deployments that were created automatically. Um, we have the two pods that were created automatically. Um, we have the ingress, which was um, created. And the services, which were created. And now let's actually have a look into how this is actually done. So this is optimized for Minikube at this point. Um, was not tested on real Kubernetes yet. So as you can see, you have those labels 
as annotations. So if you want to expose an in, like expose the service as um, as an ingress with an ingress controller, you will have to do service expose. You will have to, or you can specify the controller type, as I told you, um, as it's here, it's an hour deployment, and you can specify the volume size. The default, I don't know by heart, but probably is one giga. Okay. And so that I'm not, uh, oh, it was the correct one. Amazing. Actually, if you go here, I have a special command for that prepared. Um, because what you will do or what you will need is, as this is obviously um, not a, a domain that exists you will have to specify it in your host file. And I've prepared the script that um, appends it. So if you run this, and as I'm using fish, I need to remove this. I can go here, and now it works. So we can go again to API slash docs. And we can go to, I don't know, here. And we can log in with admin. admin. Um, so this actually takes the Minikube IP. So Minikube IP is equivalent to, if you do Docker inspect Minikube, you will get the same IP address here, but it's a convenient way to do it. Good. So we've deployed it. Um, and it was pretty straightforward, right? So besides the fact that some stuff is not implemented, that's pretty neat. So let's come back to our slides um, and go to the next available tool. That is called Customize. So what is Customize? Um, it's definitely a tool without an icon. Um, it introduces a template-free way to customizing applications, application configuration that simplifies the use of the shelf applications. Okay, what, what's that supposed to mean? So this means basically if you already have an existing Kubernetes manifest or if you're using a Helm chart um, and you want to modify just a tiny bit of it, um, you can do that pretty easily and template-free. Um, you will see why template-free is a bonus if we're going into Helm. Um, this also means that you can, uh, you can manage multiple environments. So I will show you um, how I've done it, which is basically I use Compose to create the, um, uh, the manifests. Then I've transferred them over and modified them a bit, and then created overlays, because that's the way they handle multiple environments. It's basically, you have so-called a base, and you have an overlay. The base is, for example, an off-the-shelf um, Helm chart or an already existing Kubernetes manifest. And the overlay would be, for example, I change out the image, or I change out the command, or I change uh, the ingress. So like, let's say I change it from motions.de to test.motions.de or something like that. So that's the way it's supposed to be uh, used. And it's very transparent. You will see that this uh, patching structure um, is like it's template free. You can just read it without breaking your mind. And there is a documentation and sources. And let's have a look at the template free approach using customize. And after that, we're going to do a short break. So as you can see, or as I told you, Compose creates the manifest for you if you don't pipe them into STD out and then like with the three commands that I've showed you, it creates those manifests. 
So basically you can take those manifests, you could actually probably do it on the fly as well, but you can also just copy it into base. So see here, I copied it to base, I collapsed it a bit. So here we have the config map. Um, this is basically just the environment as a config map. Then we have the deployments, both of them in one file. Um, if you want to, so for example, here I introduced an init container, um, and then we have a container, and then some resources. Um, depends on if, how deep you want to go into uh, the manifests, we can do that. Just uh, tell in the chat what, what's your preference there. Then a PVC also just copied it, the service account, and the SVC. So that's basically just a nicer concatenation of what's um, automatically generated here. And then let's say we have an overlay for Minikube. So we want to change. Let's just firstly go into the deployment because that's the stuff that interests us the most right now. So we need to change the image from registry.motions.de to our built-in Minikube uh, registry. So we'll, we have to specify the whole tree, spec template, sorry, spec template, spec init containers, in the container name, and then the image. And this guy is then just patched. So this is switched out. Um, I didn't find a way to do it for all images. Probably there is, um, but the most verbose way to do it is just list all of them. Then um, here, we can override the command. And as you see, it's pretty, pretty readable. Let's put it like that. And then for config maps, it also like it, it merges them. So if you have this config map, it um, changes the Django settings module, which is defined here. It changes it from staging to dev, and it sets the site URL, Django customize minikube.lo. And for Ingress, we have the same thing. This is actually the reason for Ingress is why I didn't merge it, because I didn't find how to do it. Because if, if you see here, this basically is the whole thing. The only thing that I could in the, do in the base would be those two path thingies, but the rest I would have to do manually anyways. So I, I said, uh, let's just get, get the Ingress into the overlay. You can also like not patch, but add new fields. And this is all def defined in those customization YAMLs. Um, this customization YAMLs includes here in the base, it just includes all the resources that you have. You will need to list all of them here. If you don't list it, it will like not deploy it. And in the overlay where it gets more interesting, you define a base. This is what it takes as base. And then you define a merge strategy, patches strategy, strategic merge, uh, like you can select some, and then um, it takes the deploy YAML here, this guy, it merges this accordingly with the other deploy YAML. Actually not like it doesn't merge the two YAMLs, they could be called differently, but it merges the, the paths that are defined. Same for the config map. And then you can add new resources here as well, as you can see here with the ingress. Something very neat as well, is, um, as you see, I have not a secret defined here, but I definitely need a secret. Um, this, of course, is, as you can see, also only for development purposes, but it generates you a secret for uh, the Django example database as a password, like with a password set. So that it's like more similar to the production. And then if you go to production, um, You'll just bitnami debug in the database. You set it to wrong. You change the site URL in the deployment. Oh, um, in the deployment, you can also introduce a so-called Nginx sidecar. Um, so you can also add more containers. You can specify an external value. That's what I've done here. So that's um, if you, because I didn't find it here, um, there is also no way that I found that you can use environment variables to pipe in um, a secret. So you would recreate the key first. So this um, Django example database production um, secret you would have to create first, otherwise this will not deploy. 
and then changing the command. Okay, and adding in all secret. And it looks the same. Um, as you can see, I've changed uh, the name and the version. Oh, wow. Um, sure. And yeah, I've added another service for the sidecar. So it's very transparent. You can, you can read it. It's not a hustle. It is similar to if you've worked with a manifest, it's just if imagine it as like splitting out two manifests and then they will be merged back together. Very transparent, very template free. I'm stressing template free because you'll see templating soon. Good. And then so that you cannot say that it doesn't work. Um, actually, a neat thing about this is that this is actually built in into um, this is actually built in into cube control itself. So the compose movement was picked up by Kubernetes. And they in included the, um, the ability to use those overlays into cube control apply. You can do cube control apply dash F, which means a file, like a blank, um, a blank YAML. But you can also do cube control apply dash K, which stands for compose. And then you can use compose. By the way, I will need to delete it first. I will not need to delete it first. Okay, a little bit in the command line. This is unexpected. Ah, let's go. So here you can see we have those two init containers now being uh, run and executed, the collect static. Um, that's a Django specific one that just collects static files and the init database, which initializes database. Now the application and the database is running and we can go to uh, Django dash Oh, that's not good. This goes on to the issue list. So there is something that didn't work out with the volumes. Um, I'll fix that. But as you can see, the application is deployed. You can reach it. Um, and the only thing that's missing right now is the static files not being served correctly. Good. Now let's do a short break, um, about five minutes, and then we're going to continue with not template-free version of this. By the way, if you have any questions regarding the two um, tools that I've presented now, for example, could also be a good time. I'll just not do presentation, but if you have questions, um, I would read the chat now. There's a question already. I, I, I will read the chat very soon. Uh, so that's a good question. I think you can read it now. Oh, yeah. The YouTube. True. So the question is, would I actually suggest hosting a database in Kubernetes in production? Um, definitely not the way that I've done it here. So definitely not in a way that is just a single part or a single deployment. Um, there is oh wow. um, there is a thing called operators, which is newer. Um, so there is, for example, one from Zalando we're currently evaluating and testing. 
um, that enables like replication of the database because one of the things that on in Kubernetes always can uh, happen is um, you will just like a node will just die and then if that's where your database was that's bad so you should have definitely have replication um, I can tell you that we're running a production database for quite some time on Kubernetes. It worked out so far, um, but I would suggest that you definitely have replication. Um, and if there is a hosted service, for example, if you go to, to Azure or something and there's a hosted service and it's critical production, I would probably use it because you will, all, uh, you will get a lot of uh, advantages with it. Even though, the, even though that is really expensive sometimes. Does that answer your question?
you some commands i can show you um like a bit of the chart but we can also do a deeper dive into the chart because helm is something that we use more frequently here um so i'm more comfortable with helm so if you want to see more templates um feel free to to uh, post into the chat um i will start off with a short introduction what helm actually is and in the meantime you can let me know what you want Good. So what is Helm? It calls itself the package manager for Kubernetes. So a package manager is something that ships a package, basically. So if you think of your Linux distribution, for example, Aptitude is a package manager. And if you do apt install, um, like, I don't know, like Linux, you get the kernel. So Helm is similar or has a similar approach it um, ships so-called charts. And the charts are a way that describes uh, an application. Um, I will show you later a bit more about this as, as it's still quite abstract right now. So what does it actually offer you? Like a package manager, it offers you revisions. So you will have the option to roll back. Like let's say I've changed the configuration, I added um, two new environment variables, but they won't work. And I need to go back now. You can do a Helm rollback. Um, you can also share your charts. For example, let's say you develop a, a, a product and you want to share it to other users who use Kubernetes. You can do that by creating a custom Helm chart. That's something you will see later that I've done for this Django application. You can share that on the hub. And you have updates, like, OK, you have that with the other ones as well. But you have differential updates that are shown nicely in the CLI, I would say. Then something you will see, and that's why I ask, this thing is definitely not template free. Um, so it has templating, Go templating in YAML files. So we'll, you will see a weird mixture of curly braces uh, and dots and uh, value dot whatever, um, which sometimes is a bit confusing because it supports all of the, like a lot of those template operations such as loops um, or accessing some, some maps and stuff like that. So you can do weird stuff. Um, you can also do requirements and dependencies. As you've shown, seen before, our application actually needs a Postgres database, which is a requirement slash independency. Kubernetes, uh, Helm, or better the Helm Hub, or better Bitnami, actually um, has a chart for that that you can use to um, deploy Postgres as like equivalent to apt install, like Helm install um, Bitnami slash Postgres to so that's neat and nice. 
documentation you will find here. And in my opinion, it's the best approach to just dive into this. Um, so I will show you how this actually looks like if you are far, far, far from template free. Okay. So you, we will start off with a chart definition. So a chart, as I told you, it's like a package. So it has a definition. Um, here in this case, th it has metadata. So I called this thing Django, um, gave it a description. So it's spe specifically made for this presentation. Um, it has a version and an app version. That's something that always confuses people that have not worked too much with Helm. So there's two different things, and this is really important. There's a thing called app version. This refers to the application that it's running inside of the chart. And then there is a version which is referring to the chart version, um, which is how it configures the application. So for example, um, if you have a Postgres um, chart, this could have version, uh, in this case, version 8.10.4, right? But this would refer to, I don't know by heart, this would refer to, I think, Postgres app version 11.8 or something. So those two versions, you will have to have a look at. There is a neat way to do that that I'm going to show you now at club.helm.sh. And if anybody can explain to me what this loading thing does, would be amazing. Because we're not, now going to wait. So we do bit dummy Postgres. Does it work like this? Postgres. Doesn't work like this. We're just, just going to do Postgres. OK. There we go. So as you can see, this is a neat way um, to show because this is app version. Oh, they had an update. This is app version 8.10.5, and this is application version 11.8. So chart version, very different from application version. Sometimes they're the same, but that's rare, I'd say. Okay. So here you see I have a dependency. So what is a dependency? A dependency just downloads this chart in this specific version into a folder called charts, where then it's are stored as tar -zs. Um Yeah, you can then from there on install it and you have a local copy in case like this chart gets like deleted or something, you still have a local copy. But um, I did not commit it. So as you see, it's grayed out. So it's in the git ignore because everybody can just do Helm. Um, how's it called? I think Helm update. And then you get the, the charts back. Good. You have a log file similar to um, NPM. Then diving into the values. So this is something that is really useful to, to see. So the values.yaml, this is the default. So here, the guy who des designed the charts defined his default values, and he defined um, the structure that this looks like. So for example, if you have a chart that is like not like this chart that has a lot of documentation, but you have a chart that is super sparse in documentation, what you can do is stable, for example, if you go to the state, like this is the repository where you can find the stable charts from, yeah, the stable charts from, uh, from um, Google. You will also see a values YAML, and then you can look up things here. They are annotated, there's examples in there. So if you're, a bit clueless of what to do, and you have a Helm chart and you want to deploy it, always have also a look into the values.yaml. So this is where you define, for example, in my case, I defined uh, an image um, with a registry and image uh, tag and so forth. And those values will then be referenced in the, um, in the chart itself. 
So, see, there's a lot of values here. And something that I did not mention yet, you can create yourself a starting boilerplate chart with Helm Create. Um, so, as you see, I mirrored basically, so they're named the same, so it's easier to follow. So, the um, config map here is mirrored. And as you can see, what the heck, what the actual heck, oof, yeah. So, it's not yet the cleanest of chart because from something like this, we should do differently, for example. But uh, as you can see, you can then access values um, with values.ingress.host. And this will propagate through values, which refers to this kind of file or the, the values you handed the, the chart. I'll show you that later. Values dot ingress dot host, and then it will put this wonderful host exactly here. And you can do the same for DB host, DB name, um, Django settings modules are hard coded. Seems like it. And then here you have something which is also interesting because, as I told you, this is the configuration of the dependency the chart that we have is a dependency. So charts have those values that I've just showed you. And here, this is the like hub. Um, you will search for password. And yeah, I didn't have replication or anything set or no replication password. But for a simple one, I just use this PostgreSQL password for a simple user. As I told you, not production. Then you say PostgreSQL for the chart and then PostgreSQL username and it specifies it as being Postgres. And this you can use and it's shared between the two, um, between the two deployments. Uh, I think the Postgres is actually a replica set. We'll see later. Good. So let's jump into the deployment. So basically what you can do is you either start from a completed manifest and try to convert it into um, a Helm template, or um, basically you can do the other way around. You, that's the way I did it. You do Helm create. It creates you a boilerplate hello world test one and then you have all of those things set like metadata name and the labels and the replica spec and all of this is like as you can see this gets all really nicely pre um, fabricated but this gives you the flexibility so um, as you see you don't have to touch it again if you for example want to add a security context to it you can just use values.pot security context and it will be applied or you can use um, an image full secret. You just can specify it later because with this like annotation, like with, um, this is only included if actually the pull secret is defined. If it isn't defined, it's not going to be in the YAML. And this is how you can construct it, right? So you can, um, with something that I've done, there's a lot of. Okay, maybe I didn't have that much time to do it all super properly. But for example, um, here, see, the database password, we actually get it from a secret key that is django.fullname Django slash PostgreSQL. This is the secret that gets created by the PostgreSQL um, by the PostgreSQL chart, and this is dynamic. So for example, if I deploy it twice and do twice with a different name, it will work twice. You can, you don't have to actually touch any YAML if you want to deploy it twice. You'll just modify the values. That's the whole idea of it. You don't, if you have configured it correctly, 
You don't want to touch the chart. You only want to tweak it using values. And that boils it down to how do you actually run it? And now, to be honest, there is two ways of doing it. There is the straightforward approach, which is an approach that I have not taken too often, to be honest. So you can do, um, and I will probably not be able to do it out of, on the fly. Um, you can do Helm install and then dash namespace dash n and then whatever and then you will have to do this dash dash set and then you will set all of the values like i want to change the ingress i can set it from command time i want to change i don't know the the size of the pv i could do it from command line but what we use is a wrapper around that that just allows us to wrap this yaml in even more yaml which is called helm file um, which also has one of the features that I didn't find in Helm yet, um, which is actually the, the support for environment variables in the values. So you cannot use here. This has to be hard code. If you want to use an environment variable, you can only do this from um, the command line. And this gets tedious. So um, what we do here is basically we have this um, Moshe's chart, however we want to call it, that is a, a very generic chart that allows you to deploy applications um, by being able to set like basically everything in this format. Like you can set containers, you can set ingresses, you can enable, for example, if you want um, SSL, you can just enable that. And this is all then just done using this Helm file where you don't have to touch any um, Go Lang templating. So for all developers here uh, from Moshes who are, here, who are in the call, um, if you are complaining about Helm file, feel free to help us write Go templating. Um, yeah. Then what does it do? So as you can see, we do here basically this values. This is just a set command and it sets image.registry to localhost 5000 and the image to Django API. So this will in itself then, if we go to deploy and to the image, it will take the registry, in this case localhost, colon 5000, then Django API and image tag. An image tag is not set. Hmm, what does it do? Yes, it goes back to the defaults and uses latest. So you can puzzle yourself around it, but as you see, it's harder to do than it was with customize because it's not as like specific. So Moment of truth. Truth. Does it still? Let's first see if I cleaned out. Nope. Uh, so I will clean out the deployment first. To show you that it actually works and I didn't tweak anything manually. And there we go, it's gone. And as you can see, you will always end up getting out a um, manifest, or in this case, a few manifests. So all of those, for example, see those labels are automatically generated. You can filter that by them. Um, the images are um, automatically adapted. 
password is set, config map set. And while I did some talking, it actually deployed. Um, and the is aesthetic. There we go. Also works here. Um, just showing you, it is, oh, misclick. It is in this case, a replication controller. What? I thought it was a replication controller. Ah, it's a replica set, sorry. Um, so it's replica set and a deployment. And there we go, two parts. Yeah, that is a short intro. I'm gonna do a bit of more command line for you. So a Helm list here shows you that we have the Django Helm in the Django Helm namespace. Um, status deployed, if you have status failed here, this is really ugly. Um, then the chart, which is chart version 1.0 and our app version 1.0. And now let's actually do a revision to show you how that looks. And then we're going to do a rollback. The only question is, what do we do? Okay, let's just do this guy. Oh, the also nice feature about Helm file is you would usually do Helm install first, and then you will do Helm upgrade after. And as you can see, it changed. So this I didn't save, but it changed the site URL in the config. It changed it in the ingress, and it's deployed, and it is revision two, and I close it. Bought them cash, and it's not there anymore. So, if you know the syntax by heart. You get a new revision. Oh, yeah. And you'll have to wait a second for it to redeploy, and there we go. You can freely roll back between revisions. Something that uh, we found is really useful if you go with Helm file is something called Atomic. Um, this will prevent you from basically going into the status here that I've showed you, this status here being failed, because if you end up in this state, it's tricky to get out of there. Um, so what Atomic does is um, com combined with the wait true and timeout, if the deployment doesn't succeed within this timeout, it will automatically roll back. And then you will have a status deployed again, which is good because otherwise rolling back manually from that state, as I told you, it's a nightmare. Then um, I still have some time left. So I could show you one neat tool that I also found along the way, or we can do Q&A. Um, depends on what you want to do. Just give me a sign in the chat for the observer. It's already visible if you know what you're looking for. Cool, okay, cool. Um, is there still DFF guys in here? Uh, 
doesn't look like it. Okay, okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> so, th this tool, um, I think it's super neat. It's called Scaffold. Um, it allows you to develop on Kubernetes. So, um, I'll show you the definition of it. Scaffold. I don't have slides for it. Um, so, it is basically um, allows, it, it is a tool that allows you to build a Docker container locally. Then you watch for changes. And then if you do a local change, it will rebuild the image, it will repush it, and then it will restart the container automatically. So this allows you to have, if you have a more complex setup in Kubernetes, like don't use your local resources, but um, deploy it to Kubernetes, but access it locally. So it's a combination of like, soon, like um, watching your file system, um, recreating the cube control, like cube control basically, and um, cube control port forward, the stuff that you've seen um, for the um, registry. So that's what it does. And it takes, luckily, um, it takes, I think, manifests, and it also takes customize, and it also takes Helm. But uh, the time I've done it was with customize. So let's just use customize. And we'll need to do this. It's big caps in their documentation. You will have to do scaffold dash 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 port dash forward. Otherwise, it will not do port forward. I tried it with specifically mentioning port forward in here. It doesn't work. You will have to do it. Otherwise, in my opinion, it's pretty useless. But who am I to judge? Oh, what? <sighs> Amazeballs. Is Docker Demon running on X as well for? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. This also used to work before. Probably have to restart the demon. Oh, god damn. Uh, Minikube stop, or can I just restart? You can stop. So I'll restart the Docker demon real quick because for some reason it doesn't like it anymore. Oh, by the way, I had to install a specific package for all this, for this madness. So if you see it now and you don't have it, you need a package if you are an arch. Okay, port forwarding again. That's why I used actually a, a replica set and not this guy. Cube system. As you can see, it recreated it, but as I've referenced a part, what? Okay, what's well, just not up yet? Please. Ah, there we go. Whatever. So now, as you can see, it builds it. Then it pushes it. Dun, dun, dun. The question is, what do I change now to? It creates the services there. It waits for the replicas to be up. Oh, one thing that I couldn't change, um, you would actually need to 
define a specific overlay for your development because you cannot really change the namespace in there. So you would need to create an overlay for yourself or a developer. Ah, it attaches to the output, as you can see. And um, what do I want to change? Something in the app. Uh, core settings, maybe base. Hmm. No. I mean, page instead of username. Hmm? Instead of username, something else. Hmm, I, I'm not sure if I can change that as easily. Hmm. Well, to show that it works, I can just do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for not being that creative, but as you can see, it detected the file change. Uh, it did an up upload. As it is configured correctly inside of the Docker container, it does then a reload. And then there we go. This is how you could work with it being deployed on Kubernetes. And to be more precise, if we go to kube control, this is not too big, but you should you you should see it. Pods dash n, and I'm reusing the kube kube no Django dash customized namespace for it. So here you can see those two. Um, Parts basically, and if I do this guy, it will clean it up, it will delete it, it will also de delete the PPC, and it's gone. I think it's pretty neat. Um, haven't used it yet um, too much. Um, configuration was okay, also not too straightforward in my opinion, but with the configuration that I've uh, given you, you should be able to adapt it along the lines. Yeah. Okay. Then that is my last tool that ha that I have up my sleeve. Um, so I'm basically done with my presentation. Um, let me just see if Sandro actually sent me something. No, he didn't. Okay. That would be, yeah. Um, there will be a feedback link soon. Um, is there already a feedback link that I didn't see, maybe in the chat or somewhere? There is a feedback link. Nice, okay, perfect. Ah, uh, okay. So I think you're open for a QA. Uh, I'm open for questions. I will just prepare the feedback link QR code as from last time. Um, and then embed it and then show it in on the screen. And we would be really happy if you provide us some feedback so we can improve. Because last time there were only five people submitting the form. Cool. Then I'll just open up the chat real quick. Yeah. So the link works. And I'm open for questions.
Okay, meanwhile, thank you, Dominic and Lucas, for this really great event. And the next lecture will be, let me take a look, on June 18th, because next week is holiday in Germany. And next time we get an introduction to serverless from Maxime Rollier, who is Microsoft Cloud Developer at OCAD. Okay, if there are no remaining questions, then thank you for attending our event. We will see us in two weeks and have a nice weekend. Thank you for okay. listening and uh, have a nice weekend. See you.